So again, lots of pulling on the cheek, right? The key is to really stretch that tissue tight. Um, it helps with the incision and it allows you to cut a little more laterally toward the Minnesota. And then we're just going to release the papilla there. And come up in around here. So again, we're just going to demonstrate a little different flap. So I do lots of triangular flaps, but I also do do envelope flaps depending on the case of so this one here. Basically choosing an envelope flap, so we're just opening that up and making sure that we have good access. And you'll see that these open up quite nicely, certainly adequately for what we need to do here, right? So the key is to get that buccal tissue away so you have nice clean bone and a good surgical field and then kind of just try to get up underneath of this lingual tissue to get it off of the tooth because again that's always our obstruction when we're trying to lift that tooth out. Here, you know what, I mean I probably could have got an elevator in there and just popped that tooth up and out. Uh, it's very likely that it would have came out with a little bit of pushing being as he's a younger patient. But you're never wrong to section the tooth, so I'm just going to section through the tooth just to ensure that all goes well. So again, we've got that periosteal this time positioned lingually and it's reflecting off the tissue and Really, truly, I mean, you get a cleaner surgical field when you're when you're doing that. So, um, makes a world of difference when you can see what you're doing and you're not fighting the tissue. Again, it's a 45 degree handpiece, 703 burr, and again, we're cutting through there, and we can see the pulp chamber right there. You can kind of see it peeking out, and uh, that's what we're looking for. So, we're looking to identify the pulp chamber. And that gives us some clues about our depth, as do the flutes on the burr, right? This makes it trickier when your assistant gets their hand right down in, in your face. <laughs> uh, happens sometimes, but they don't stay for long, which is good. And not to worry you, but I, I could see there actually, it's just the camera was obscured. I wasn't cutting blindly. Never cut blindly. Always make sure you can see what you're doing down there. So. Here we're satisfied that we've cut through enough of that tooth, again, not all the way through the lingual, but enough that we can separate it. And there we engage the pulp chamber and lift the tooth up and out. And those are so nice when, you, when you're able to split them evenly like that. It just makes you feel good. Put that out and again, the spade goes on the mesial to lift out the remaining root. Once you pry these out, again, the buckle is usually the place to go. You can kind of lift them out the rest of the way. Here again, we need to get back in and just curette, make sure there's nothing left uh, in that socket, and then give it a really good flush underneath of that flap. And the envelope flaps, again, they're kind of nice for irrigating because that little envelope kind of catches any debris in it. It's a nice little spot to run the syringe through, so it tends to be a little easier to clean up and can see too how nicely the flap kind of lays down when you're done right so it is a nice approach to use here again just a single suture in behind that lower second molar and um, could you put more sutures in that I mean you totally could so some will do this initial one to reposition the flap and then they'll do another one sort of distal to this, close up that, that distal incision. Occasionally I do that, it, it just depends. If I'm looking at it after I place this one, that's usually when I make that decision. So I'll look at it and I'll see kind of how open it is in behind. And if it's looking really open, then sometimes I'll, I'll add another one. You have to be a little bit aware. And that, that's something that uh, I picked up actually from a surgeon, which, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you should be able to cut a suture with a scalpel, right? But I'd never thought to do that before. And the only <laughs> only reason I did it was just because I thought that'd be cool to show in the video, just a, a little tip. So you can use your scissors, obviously, which is the preferred approach, but um, yeah, a scalpel will do as well. And it works really, really cleanly and really nicely. Here, of course, yeah, you can see how the tissue is quite open yet when we finished that one. So the decision was just to pass one more suture through. 
and help to tighten that up a little bit. So again, we've still got a little bit of space that isn't watertight, right? So that we can get a little bit of drainage. And that's a good thing. There is a checking the needle holder. And uh, sometimes you get like a little fragment of suture or something in it that kind of makes things slip out of there a little bit easier. And we're just going to finish by cinching up the suture here one more throw. Make sure that we got things all good here on that side. These guys, they tend to stay tied pretty well. Uh, so the 3 -0 versus the 4 -0, I don't find a huge difference. So uh, I used to lean more to the 3 -0. That was the one that I used more frequently, thinking that I would need more sort of tensile strength back there. But really, truly, uh, they seem to hold up really well as long as you get your knots tied tight. So here's the other side now. And um, you can see that tooth was partly peeking in there, which is great. So we know that it's near the surface. Making our distal release and then just releasing that little papilla in behind that lower second molar. Again, we want to make a decent flap, but nothing uh, too crazy, right? We don't need a, a ton of access for this one. We go back convex side of the periosteal towards the teeth, get the flap started, and then flip it over and start to kind of lever up on it um, and you'll you'll get kind of a feel after a while for when you're under the periosteum so you want to kind of feel for that that uh, layer of tissue right so you'll be able to feel it not really stretching as much I don't know how to describe it I guess it just it has a different feel to it so you'll know once you're under it and once you are you'll be able to cleanly reflect the flap so you'll also be able to tell so like this last bit here where I stopped kind of cut again you'll be able to tell sort of when you're uh, facing some resistance. So again, we just have to get on the bone with that sharp tip of the periosteal. And we found it there now, and then we just got to lever this up using that fat end of the periosteal. So here now, again, we've got everything kind of lifted off of there. And uh, occasionally you get that, I don't know if you can see it here, I guess you can a little bit, and that's kind of what was hanging me up on this one, is next to the tooth there's almost like a natural trough, or it's just like a, a little ditch in the bone between uh, where the tooth is and where the bone begins. And uh, that sometimes is where your periosteal goes into when you're trying to get that flap elevated off of there, and then it's a little bit tricky getting under that periosteum from that point. So again, a tip for that would be you want to start a little bit further mesially, so you could start a little bit more on that second molar or alongside it, and then work laterally, uh, you know, under the flap to release that part a little bit more distal. <clears throat> Here now we're just cutting through the tooth, so didn't really have to do much with this one other than just section it. And again, quite frankly, at 16 years old, uh, the position of that tooth, potentially we could have just elevated it out, but. Um, just to spare his jaw and, and hopefully have something be a little bit easier on him, I was sectioning the tooth here. So again, we don't go all the way through the tooth, we just go part way and we split the tooth. Here you'll see that again, the split wasn't exactly where it should be, right? That happens sometimes, but that's okay. So that removes that distal portion of the tooth and that gets everything out of the way so that you can then elevate out the remaining bit, right? So he's young, so those root tip, or the roots that are remaining usually aren't very tightly bound, especially when they're uh, not fully formed. And it's just removing the obstruction uh, to get the tooth out, that's the key. So again, with the split the way it is, it's certainly not as cool, right? It looks way better when you get that distal root out. Um, but this is reality, so this happens sometimes. You just don't quite hit the right mark. So going back, and I'm just cutting a little bit away, uh, again, just along the buckle. And then I'm going to go in here and just punch a purchase point into the tooth. So again, the 703 burr, I'm just sinking that in here. And I'm going to put a Cogswell B into there. And you'll see what I do is I lever off the bony shelf. And the suction kind of obscured it there, but just kind of pops out the tooth. So gives me a bit of a handle to lift the tooth out. So that's a, a good trick if you're ever having trouble delivering the tooth. Now, you, know, you might have been able to get it from another angle with the elevator, but 
um, that's a, a quick and easy way to do it and just something to to show you demonstrate it live right so here again we're just cleaning a little bit uh, within the socket which again you always should do especially when you've been doing some uh, drilling we're trying to irrigate in under the flap and down in the socket just get everything tidied up and then again we just go back with our 4 suture And again, I may mention this in another video, but this is a tapered needle, so it's it's like totally smooth on all the sides. And really, the only drawback to it is that it spins a little bit in the needle driver sometimes. So um, just because it's round, right? There's no flat edges to it. And uh, other than that, I find it's extremely kind to the tissues, very kind to the tissues, as opposed to a, a reverse cutting needle. And uh, yeah, it's quickly become kind of my go-to suture for these third molar cases and elsewhere in the mouth as well. Once again, just doing some throws and we're just sliding them down there. I'm using my middle finger to reach down into the mouth, um, which kind of allows me to get further back there. That's always the challenge is, is reaching in there, right? And, So I'm just going to clip this off. I've transferred both these to my left hand, uh, needle driver and the suture. Here's just a look at the tooth after sectioning. That could have been prevented by aiming a little bit mesial to the buckle groove, right? That would have been a better section. There's the purchase point.